Hello and welcome to the vlog. I think we're on 145 or 146 maybe. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual, which is I'm going to talk about something that has confused and even to a certain extent bothered me for a very long time. And a couple of months ago I found an article from a source that I trust um, for this sort of information and uh they cover they cover it so i haven't read it yet but i want to I want to lay out my concerns and then give you um like read this article and then maybe reflect on it after and maybe we'll actually have an answer before that i want to talk about and i'm being a little quiet because um got a roommate who I think is sleeping. Probably has work tomorrow. I have work tomorrow, so this will have to be a quicker video. Regardless, um, we're going to start before I get to that topic. We're going to do some vlog, vlogging. Um, I know it's dark. I don't know if I want to turn on lights. I get a little bit of ambience with the, uh, the darkness here. Let's use this lamp. It's all right. So, uh, this weekend was tough. Uh, I'm not sure what what was going on. Um, I could <laughs> try and do something weird to figure it out, but I'm not really in the mood to do that. So, basically, um, yeah, really rough headache, sleep seems to be working half as good as it should i think like when you get six or seven hours of sleep you should feel okay not like you got two hours of sleep and you're dying um maybe i, I was coming down with something but i feel a lot better today i was able to be a little bit productive not super productive i, I struggled to write more than like three sentences at a time But uh, that was this weekend. I also decided that I'm going to start tracking my progress. Like when I work, like I work on a lot of projects. I don't know how much I talk about them on the vlog. The plan is, and I should do it now, that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to write down what I do when, and um, I'm also going to start like planning a little better uh like more specifically what i want to do in the weekend instead of having giant goals and you know that you, you should be breaking down goals so it looks like today i wrote um i always underestimate so that um i know that my my numbers are very very close to being um correct And it looks like I got around 400 words, which is not a lot. Uh, 430 on the dot. So I have a calendar. This is like a like a briefcase calendar. And I gotta go ahead and write in that I wrote 430 words on July um, 17th. 30 words PSP chapter 49 and so with these little pieces of information I can sort of reconstruct what I've done um, later when I need a plan and this is important especially since I don't have school giving me specific um, goals like I don't have to write an essay next Friday you know what I mean what I can do is I can, after two or three weeks of tracking what I what I can do, being productive, while also working for a full-time job, is that 
I can understand how much I can get down in a week and maybe push it a little bit every week. Um, but I can be practical. And then once you know how much you're completing, let's say you have um, a project that takes, well, let's just use writing a book. Let's say you want to write a book and it's going to take about, you've done the outline and you know it's going to take about 30 chapters. And you know, or you think you can write a chapter a day, me meaning you can finish the book in a, in a month. But sorry for the train. But then it turns out it takes more than a day to write a chapter because you have to rewrite or some days you have off days and you don't write at all or you only write like I did today. Okay, that's getting a little oppressive, so I'm going to pause and shut the window. Okay, so, and I, I brushed my hair a little. It didn't really help whatever is going on on this side, though. Um, the cat is in and she's gonna be disappointed that the window is shut now um yeah so you find out it actually like you can't work every single day of the week we're not really built for that um i think in the uh during the french revolution they tried to institute a 10-day week to match with their decimal system and people burnt out like crazy and it was horrible so you definitely want one or two rest days in your week, things like that. You might find you can only really push out, if you want to be um, keeping quality, you can only push out three or four chapters a week. But now, since you're keeping track of that stuff, now you have a timeline. You're not a month, but you're also not like three years. Some people take years to finish a novel that doesn't take years to finish. Um, if it's going to take years, you really should try and serialize it, like publish it chapter by chapter. Um, Charles Dickens did that with a lot of his books. And um, I believe like War and Peace and Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy's books are like that. So The Count of Monte Cristo. But if you're doing three per week, it's going to take you 10 weeks and maybe you add an extra week or two just to be safe and um, that gives you one-fifth of a year um, or 12 weeks is gonna be yeah it's gonna be around one-fifth of a year and so um, one one Divided by 5 is 0.2. Um, that is times 12. 2.4, yeah, so two and a half months. And knowing that if you keep to that, this pace, you're going to be done by this date or around this date means maybe you set it as a deadline and it keeps you actually right working on the project. Um, and if it's a project that you have to abandon, maybe it's a it's a novel that you end up shelving, at least um, it forces you to make that decision more um, seriously instead of holding on to it and trying to write it and trying to write it and maybe you're just not motivated and not really taking into consider that no, I am motivated, it's just that this, this isn't really working as a project. Um, and maybe that's why some people get stuck writing a novel for two or three years. Um, my novel, The Soul and Prince, has been being written for a few years now, but I stopped during university, which is, you know, eight months out of the year. So it's really a lot less than that, but I definitely have been slacking, and maybe I should do that. Maybe I'll make a vlog about it once I figure out the math. So let's get into the other thing. Um, one thing in my own spiritual journey... Um, and it was actually a philosophical journey. Some people have like an existential crisis where they don't, like they question existence and the meaning of life and things like that. I never really had that. What I had instead was like, okay, it was almost a Cartesian search for something that was real. Like really, really, um, something that didn't change in all of history. And so... You know, you could say humans, okay, 
good good starting point what about humans um stories okay which stories um or cultures which culture right which culture survived greek is a great place to start a lot of people really like greek philosophy um greek literature like the 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 iliad and the odyssey um there's a lot of homeric poems that are fascinating um and the the problem is that we don't have a continuous tradition which means that if if we're looking for something that was solid that existed across time um as like a human cultural um through line greek is great because it was revived during the renaissance one of the movements within the renaissance was classicism which was the the kids used to learn like greek in school so as part of this movement like you would learn greek you would learn latin and you could read everything that ancient greece and ancient rome wrote and so they're reviving these texts translating these texts um they found a whole treasure trove of um i think like plato because plato who in the medieval era we only had a few manuscripts from plato um and we found like a treasure trove or it might have been that the um the arabs were preserving it because it's not just you know europe that appreciated the ancient greeks um arabs uh, i think persians this is really bugging me what's this whatever this is oh it's a little it's a little like fly away anyway let's all agree to pretend that it's not happening do i have a hat not really that sucks uh <laughs> Um, but yeah, obviously it turns out that religions are what survive. <clears throat> and so basically you've got like Chinese <clears throat> religious tradition, which goes back a few millennia. Um, and I'm really serious. Like there was a group trying to figure out how to preserve, like, cause we have nuclear waste that's going to out last a lot of like the average lifespan of a civilization or our country um this nuclear waste will outlast and so how do we make sure that people know that it's dangerous a thousand years in the future or, or however many years 400 i don't know um one of the theories was let's start a religion around how dangerous these chemicals are because that's one thing that's going to survive when books get destroyed languages change um you know civilizations are gone that was one of the theories as to how to preserve the knowledge of this danger um so you've got uh buddhism doesn't go back that far uh i can google it now buddhism was an indian religion founded um around the sixth century bce so that's it's not very old that's like when the bible stopped being written like that the end of the bible is sixth century <laughs> or seventh century so you know that's not great um hinduism or vedic or whatever um takes us back to around four thousand And I was seriously like considering all these, not Greek, I just used it as a kind of universal example. The Indian religion. Um, definitions, beliefs. That's not helpful. When Hinduism is also very, very, like Hinduism is a group of religions that are kind of very similar. Um, almost like you can imagine how there's a lot of Christian denominations, except Hindus don't really fight with each other. It's kind of like how, you know, 
let's use a scientific uh, like a science uh, comparison biologists don't fight with um, chemists you know what I mean uh, so Hinduism is thought to have started around 2300 BC um, and then Judaism uh, like basically like Christianity started around around 30 AD and really got instantiated into what it is today because early Christianity was in like crazy everybody had their own opinion of what was the true uh, true Christianity there were even Christian sects that might have be believed in multiple gods like it was crazy back back then and then in the, around the year 300 they hammered it out with the council of nicaea so if we're talking 300 a.d or or ce that's too late so before that we had um uh judaism right before the new testament uh, any christian would agree that the jews were right um and so I was kind of inclined that way. I lived in a very, um, not a Christian culture, but if you were going to choose a religion, it was going to be Christian because there's no other, like there's churches everywhere, especially in small towns, which is where I usually lived. There were, there's nothing else. Um, so it's either church or nothing. So I was vaguely Christian already. Um, and then I ended up sort of finding out that there's a whole thing of of like you can believe in judaism but you don't have to convert and the upside to that is um you uh you don't have to do 613 commandments you don't have to not work on the sabbath and not working means like if you flip a light switch bam you've broken the word of god in one of the ten commandments actually um whereas um non-jews are expected to uphold around 60 to 90 commandments um and to be fair in the, your average jew is only upholding i think around 120 or 200 or so commandments and there's a ton of overlap like you know don't steal don't kill the basic stuff like that um <clears throat> basically the the, ten, the parts of the ten commandments that christians follow anyway because christians don't really follow um the sabbath the sabbath is a major one um it's not obli obligatory to um to honor your father and your mother as a non-jew and the reason for that is because um let's say your your parent was i don't know make up a religion an idol worshiper uh let's say they they worshiped the stars um and then they told you, oh, do this ritual with me. You could be like, I'm sorry. You know, there's no biblical commandment for me to honor your request for me to do that. I can't do it. Whereas, um, you know, it's a little more strict if it's an actual commandment. Although a lot of books say you can take it on as a bonus. And you do get rewards for doing bonus stuff, according to, I believe, Maimonides. So that's great. It's very fun. Very exciting. Um, maybe I'll convert in the future but uh, i'd probably want to cut my hair and be like super official and wear a little hat and stuff like that and we're not really at that point yet um in addition you know um it might be difficult to like one of the things that i thought about is that once you if you become jewish you cannot a you can never go back you're always jewish so if you stop doing jewish stuff God's going to hold that against you. Whereas if you never converted and you're not doing Jewish stuff, that's good. <laughs> um, the other thing is that the dating pool shrinks, right? Because Jews can only only marry Jews, um, especially a guy. Like if I if if a man a Jewish man ma marries a non-Jew, the the wedding's not it's not recognized so if if you try to marry a non-jew 
or if you're non-Jewish and you try to marry a Jew, it no rabbi will recognize it. So you're basically not married to the point, like they take it so seriously that if you later decided, if a Jewish person later decided that they wanted to marry a Jew, they wouldn't even need a divorce, um, like a, a religious divorce. You'd obviously still want to get a legal divorce um, through the government. The same thing, by the way, for um, homosexuals. It's just not recognized as a union. Um, similar, like, we're, we're the same way when it comes to, like, uh, if you want to marry, you know, a book or or a bed post or something like, you know, you got a two by four and you want to marry, like, there's no government that's going to be like, yeah, let's do it. It's just going to be like, okay, you can think you did it, but nothing happened. It doesn't mean anything. Stuff like that. Um, wasn't there a marriage to, a, like, somebody in Family Guy, the, the um, comedy show, married a pie or something, and then, like, like a, a minute after the wedding, they ate the pie, and they're like, oh, no, what have I done? Anyway, we're kind of getting into silly territory, but I found, you know, I found this thing that has existed at least since the flood of Noah, um, and there are a lot of ancient, a um, lot of ancient accounts of a flood in many, many, many different cultures, even in North America, where nobody in the Middle East was talking to North America back then. Um, they have two separate flood stories that I, I can tell you. Like, one of them was basically the whole world was flooded, and everybody was, you know, in their canoes. And they all grabbed onto, um, onto each other's canoes. And I don't know if that formed into an island or something like this. I, I just know that there were canoes. Um, it's called, uh, in North America, it's called Turtle Island by many... Um, indigenous uh, cultures and so maybe I don't know maybe they found a great turtle shell and um, harbored there and became North America there's also earth diver uh, myths basically the animals dived down and like one by one and none of them could hold their breath long enough then one don't want to get this wrong but it might have been like a muskrat uh, which is uh, like roughly similar layer to a beaver dive down and was able to do it because like they spent a lot of time in the water might have been an otter and grab some mud and like they were able to dive and grab mud and mud and mud and eventually built an island so um, that's like where did all this land come from myths but they presuppose that there was a flood first then of course there's the um, uh, the well-known, I think, Epic of Gilgamesh. Anyway, there's an old story from that civilization, the Mesopotamian myth. But it's funny because, like, Abraham was a Mesopotamian as well, so it's not as if he couldn't have told them. And he was a very influential figure, um, according, of course, to the Bible. He fought in a battle with five kings and won, like, all at once and he won so like he had a lot of followers people think abraham was just you know this lone shepherd wandering the fo in the in the desert but like first of all he had a wife um and second of all um he had enough followers like we know he had a servant named eliezer he had enough followers that he was winning wars right international wars on five fronts um so we should not underestimate the amount of followers that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob might have had. Um, people say that they probably, like, there's no proof for their existence, but um, the Jewish people, you know, say, that's my ancestor. And a lot of the things, like, there weren't a whole lot of miracles going on during the era of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um like the biggest miracle is that uh, Sarah's Sarah was not able to have kids, and then she could. Okay, <laughs> you know, 
Um, also, you know, they were in their hundreds, I think, so they were living quite a long time. I don't know, what does an all-natural diet do for you? But, you know, maybe the numbers are wrong. Who, who knew, knows how well they were ca counting years? That's if you want to rationalize everything. I don't. I'm fine with them being a hundred and whatever years old. The point is, it's plausible enough, and like we have multiple accounts of flood stories, um, all happening around the same era, roughly. There's another train. It's wild. Um, so, hi. Hi, cat. Are you coming up here? I will pet you if you come. Um, anyway, that's where I've rested my head. But the problem is, like, it still bugged me because Judaism doesn't go back as far as Abraham. Judaism technically starts when they got the Ten Commandments. Um, or the Torah. Um, and that was a thousand years or so after, um... Abraham and and Noah. I think it was a thousand years after Noah. I might be getting the dates a little a little off, but again, it's it's actually um When did Judaism begin? Nearly four thousand years ago, and the Torah was around three thousand. So it's actually like further back than Hinduism. Um, although I think it might be, f like, Hinduism's 4,000 years old, Judaism is, um, perhaps 3,000 years old, 4,000 if you go back to Abraham, um, and so, so now we've got our timeline, but then you find out things like, oh, um, you know, they didn't actually get the, the Torah until a thousand years after um, or centuries after anyway, it might have been like 600 years. And then, then I found out, okay, the Bible, like this is an important sacred document. I'm assuming it's the same Bible that Moses wrote, right? I inspired by God. But that's, like, people doubt that oh, there must have been errors transmitting over time, but, like, the Quran has been very, very well transmitted because they had all sorts of rules for how to do it, and yet, like, you're supposed to memorize the whole thing. Um, the, um, the Torah is so detailed of how to, how to reproduce it. Like, they have tables, so you put every letter into a square on a table, and, like, you know, if it's you know, A, and then A to Z, and then 1 to, let's say, 30. A, 12, on page 50, has to be a Q. You know, like, every single letter, they know where it goes. So it's very, very rigorous. Almost certainly the same thing. That, you know, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were over 2,000 years old, and it was the same, um, you know, Judy, Jews were split and spread across the world, and all of their Bibles remained the same as each other, so it's very rigorous. But the alphabet's different in the older Torahs. Basically, any Bible written before around 600 BCE, basically around the time of Ezra, you had a different script. It wasn't that cool sort of block letters that we have now. Um, it it was like shapes, like little shapes. Um, in fact, it looks similar to the ancient Greek script or the ancient, um, in fact, almost identical to the ancient Phoenician script, which is one of the first alphabets. So it makes sense. It's like, oh, that's cool. It was written in one of the first alphabets. But why is it different now? And if it's this is a holy text, why is it different now? This is the key question that I'm going to be reading the article about. It's like, what's going on here? And I didn't know for a while. And I got, like, some answers. And I think the answer this article is going to give is going to be that. And it's a, it's a good enough answer. 
uh, but there's certain things like certain teachers will draw metaphors using the shape of the letters and be like, this letter stands for this, and we can see that echoed in the shape of this letter. It's like, okay, if that's not the original letter, I'm going to pull it up now so we can understand what I'm talking about here. If, um, if that's, there is, there it is, right? Um, let's shrink it a little bit. Humbod.org, a brilliant website. Uh, okay, let's, sorry about all that. There we go. What is the authentic ancient Hebrew alphabet? Well, I'm not going to, like, go in through a whole thing there. But um, it does, trust me, it does say alphabet. <laughs> um, is it this one on the left or this one on the right? Mo the ancient one or the modern one? Question. I recently read about some ancient writings that were in a script called Paleo, or Proto-Hebrew, or Paleo-Hebrew. It's often called Paleo-Hebrew. Um... Oh, so that's the natural size there, and then I make it bigger, which is good, because we need to be able to read it. Um, so there it is. There's Paleo-Hebrew. Which the Jews supposedly used to write in before the current Hebrew script. What's up with that? What is the authentic ancient Hebrew alphabet? And in what script was the Torah originally written? Remember... The Torah, like, came to God in a vision, and perhaps even the letters themselves. So why would Moses write it in the wrong, like, the alphabet that people are using during his time, rather than, you know, the one from God, apparently? Indeed, there are, like, this is a huge deal for me. And if you're, you know, if you're religious, this should be a huge deal for you. Indeed. And even if you aren't, it's kind of an interesting, you know, archaeological adventure. There are two scripts. One is called Ketav Ivri, or Hebrew script. Ivri being uh, like Hebrew or like, you know, Abraham Ivri. It is called Abraham, you know, the Ivri. Also called Phoenician or Proto slash Paleo Hebrew. There you go. I told you it's very, very similar to Phoenician. It's just the Phoenicians added like a couple extra letters. Um, this is the alternative form of ancient Hebrew alphabet you, that you have discovered. The script is still widely used during the age of the Mishnah and was well known to the sages. The Mishnah is like a, a big community discussion and commentary and argument about um, the Bible that was written around was you know maybe 2 BC 200 BCE to 2 to 300 uh, CE actually it's probably going to give us a nice explanation here the first compilation of the oral law authored by Rabbi Yehuda, Yehuda Hanasi approximately 200 CE um, part of the Talmud was well known to sages the other script Ka Katuv Ashrit, or Assyrian script, is the one we know today as the Hebrew alphabet. It's true. This is this is like the Assyrian. Um, and Assyrian is also very, very similar to Hebrew. Um, Aramaic, I mean, the Aramaic is. While this may be a fascinating revelation for some, your question regarding the script in the Torah was written or not is not a new one. In fact, the Talmud itself discusses this very question and gives three options. And also, it's important to know the Assyrians were like the big bad guys in a certain period of the Bible. Um, there were the ones who destroyed the northern kingdom and carried off the ten lost tribes. So like, why would you use their alphabet if it's called Assyrian script? Um... Here are the options. A. Marzuta, some say Mar -uko, Ukfa, said originally the Torah was given in Israel in the Ivri letters and in the sacred Hebrew language, like both. 
Later in the times of Ezra, the Torah was given. Um, or sorry, the, every letter is in the Hebrew language. So it's, it's the exact same words. It's just like the font that they changed. Um, later in the times of Ezra, the Torah was given the Ashrut script and the Aramaic language. What? <laughs> Finally, they selected for Israel the Ashrut script and the Hebrew language, leaving the Ivory characters and the Aramaic language, which the Mishnah is written in, for the commoners. Um, who are the commoners? Rav Chista said, the Kutites, the Samaritans. What is Ketav Avri? Rav Chista said, it's Labana script. The ancient Hebrew script is uh, like a Le Le Lebanon script. So that's option one, is that like originally you had Hebrew and this, this old script, and then later we got this new script and Assyrian, and they went, okay, well, we want the original Hebrew, but we'll use the new script. And so they kind of crossed the wires and left the other two for the commoners. It was taught. Rebbe said, the Torah was originally given to Israel in Ashrut script. The one they have now. Like, it was originally, so he's claiming that it was originally this one. The one word they're using now. Um, when they sinned, it was changed to the old script. And then when they repented, uh, the Ashrut script was reintroduced. This is very interesting. So basically they're saying the one that it changed to later, that was the original one. And when they were sinning and warring between each other with the two, the two kingdoms, um, and then they were in exile, they had to deal with this lesser script. But then when they repented in the time of Ezra and rebuilt the temple, the second holy temple, they got the script back. I like this one. Opinion C. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar said, in the name of Rabbi Elazar ben, ben Parta, who said in the name of Rabbi Elazar Hamode, the writing was never changed. It was never in the old script. That's an interesting, that's also interesting. We're going to get some explanations because that's an audacious claim to say, oh yeah, by the way, the Bibles you found like that, they're like weird offshoots. So seemingly, opinions B and C hold that the Torah was originally written in Ash, Ashurit, Ashurit, and opinion A holds that it was in, was in Ivri. But it's not that simple. Let's see what happens when we examine the tablets. Miraculous letters. The Talmud describes the miraculous script of the tablets. Rav Chista said, The letters Mem and Samach of the Shech tablets stood in place only by miracle. Talmud, I'm assuming we're talking about the uh, stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Talmud explains that the letters were engraved all the way through the stone to the opposite side almost like a like a weld cut probably now since the letter samach and the final mem are completely close to almost like the letter o um that means that the middle has to be floating there the section of stone in their centers was unattached to the bodies of the tablets and could have remained in place only through miracle like they were levitating in the middle this however is true only with regarding regard to ketav ashrut Assure it. I'm just going to say, assure it. In Ketav Ivri, neither the Mem nor the Samach are completely closed. So here you can see what they're talking about. At the bottom, these symbols are closed, but here they're not at all. But a different letter, it, letter is. Interesting. What is especially difficult with this passage is that the author, Rav Chista, who is effectively saying that the tablets were given in the current script, the very same rabbi who agrees with and elaborates upon the first opinion that it was given in the old script. What's going on here? What complicates things even further? So like, but wait, there's more. 
um, and it's worse. What complicates things even further is that there's an opinion in the Jerusalem Talmud, yeah, there's two Talmuds, um, that it was the letter Ayin that was held in place miraculously. That would imply that it was written in the old script and not Asherit, the new script, since the letter Ayin in Ivri, as opposed to Asherut, is indeed a closed letter. Oh my gosh, I'm guessing this is Ayin. See below. Special versus common. To resolve this, Rabbi Yom Tov al Ashbili, known as Ritva, explains. So he's much later, a thousand years later. Explains that the tablets in the Torah scroll that were kept in the Holy Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, were written in the special script they use today, Ketiv Ashurit. This is considered a sacred script. However, neither Moses nor the Israelites wished to use that holy script in their everyday mundane purposes in their everyday Bibles. The reverence extended even to the Torah scrolls that were written for the purpose of study by the masses. So they were written in Ketiv Ivri. So if you're writing for everyday stuff like your banking or your homework, that's going to be in like this squiggly one. But the holy one kept in the, the, uh, the ark, it's going to use these block letters that we use today. Or as Rabbi Yehuda Luz known as the Maharal of Prague, 1600s, this is even later, this is like Renaissance era, puts it, while the tablets and the original Torah school were written in the beautiful Ashurut script, because um, Ashurut can actually be translated to beautiful, it's only logical that Torah for the masses would be given to them in a script the people were familiar with, you know, so they could read it. Rabbi Dave, David... Ibn Zimra, known as Rabaz, um, a little bit earlier, explains that, 1500s, explains that when we say the tablets were written in Ashurut script, it's only the first set of tablets. The ones about which the verse states, now the tablets were God's work and the inscription was God's inscription engraved on the tablets. There are two sets of tablets. Moses broke one um, when he saw the, the Israelites sinning. Second set of tablets, however, were the ones that, which God tells Moses, inscribe these words for yourself. They were written in the script, script of the masses. Thus, the Babylonian Talmud is referring to the first set of tablets, while the tradition in the Jerusalem Talmud is referring to the second set of tablets. However, the debate in the Talmud about the script of the Torah concerns which letters the Jews themselves used, not which, um, which of the stone tablets were used. Rabaz further points out that until the Babylonian exile, the, the Jews were referred to as Hebrews, Ephraim. The script may have well may well have been the Ivri script. However, after the Babylonian exiles, they no longer called themselves Hebrews, perhaps because at this time the beautiful Ketiv Ashirut script was taught by the prophets. Belshazzar and the writing on the wall. Some commentators posit why. When the writing appeared on the wall during Belshazzar's feast, none of the Jews present were able to interpret it. Most Jews were only familiar with Ivri, the old script, while Daniel, a leader and wisest Jew at the time, not me, the prophet Daniel, <laughs> was familiar with the Ashurut script. After this incident, the script became somewhat better known. King Josiah, or Hosea, king, son of King Ammon, um, and the Moses Torah scroll. And the above explanation also sheds light on another historical incident. In the course of the repairs to the Holy Temple, King Josiah's reign, the high priest Hil Hilkiah found a Torah scroll, and the Jews turned to a scribe to have it read. In the verses, Hilkiah describes finding not a, but the Torah scroll, i.e. the Torah scroll written by Moses himself. The reason many couldn't read it was because it was written in the Ashurit script that we use today. Script but not language. Although there are different opinions on the type of script the ancient Jews used, it is important to keep in mind there's absolutely no disagreement, not even among scholars, regarding the language itself. All agree that the language of the Torah was Hebrew, the holy tongue, the language of creation. Um, it's the language that when God said, let there be light, he said it, apparently, in Hebrew. Um, if only because those verses are written in Hebrew. 
So that's fascinating. I think I think that the idea that it was originally written in the script that we use today in this one, that's an audacious claim and I like it. So I'm I'm probably going to stick with um the idea that you know, the Ten Commandments were probably written with that. Um, and that explains why you can make all sorts of teaching metaphors with like, oh, a bit looks like this. And so it's like a house with an entrance. And bet, you know, means house. Um, I think that's fun. There's also a lot of um, like mystical ideas associated with the four letters and names. The four letter name written in the Ashurut script. And I just want everybody who's not familiar with Hebrew to know that um, the idea that the Bible used to look like this instead of like this on the right is might be completely foreign to some people. They might not even know that there's two alphabets. Um, but this is called the Ashurit script or the beautiful script. And maybe it's beautiful because it's the one that God decided to use for the first set of tablets and Moses decided to use for the first a Torah scroll and I think the proof from King Josiah like the Belshazzar one is interesting but the idea that they found the Torah scroll the original one and they couldn't read it because they were so used to the Ivry script um, the kind of squiggly looking one And so they had to find a scribe to read the original um, Ashrut, Ashirut uh, script. That's fascinating to me. I think that this, this on its own kind of like proves it to me that this, this Assyrian script, this Ashirut script, where, where's a good example for it? Um, maybe here. Yeah, these letters. Um... I think it's proof enough, certainly proof enough for me that this is the original one and then by the time of Ezra they were kind of in a good enough state spiritually that they could accept this script. So I'm happy I read that. That answered my question. Now it's really late and I have to go to bed. So um just want to say if if you made it this far and you found that interesting please write a comment um maybe i remember something oh i needed to, i need to tell somebody so i have an update that i'm going to talk about in a vlog or two and it's it's kind of a big one so I'm going to save it, but look forward to that. Um, otherwise, I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found it as interesting or maybe even more interesting than I did. Um, and I hope to see you next time.